In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, my dear respected gathering, I am humbled to greet you with the greetings of peace and the greetings of humanity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And to my friends in humanity, I greet you with the translation of May the peace and blessings of God Almighty be with you. On behalf of the Tariq Islamic Center, the executive and members, we're delighted to welcome each and every one of you here. And kindly permit me to begin with reciting from the glorious Quran. As Muslims, whatever we do, we always begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know each other. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most righteous from among you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and aware. Again, my respected gathering, we're honored to welcome you and we have a wonderful session where we have two eloquent presenters. However, we also have an eloquent moderator in our own brother Sadat Anwar and I'm going to kindly ask him to moderate this afternoon session and he will conduct for the remaining of the evening insha'Allah ta'ala. Brother Sadat. Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome again to Dalek Islamic Center for this, uh, for this wonderful debate. The topic of tonight's debate is, is the New Testament the Word of God? Did I get the title right? Yeah. Is the New Testament the Word of God? The New Testament being the second half of the Christian Bible. Uh, on the affirmative side is Mr. Louis Dizon to my left. He is the Christian speaker. He'll be representing the Christian perspective on this topic. He will be arguing that yes, the New Testament is the uh, Word of God. And on the negative side is uh, Mr. Ijaz Ahmed, who is visiting us from Trinidad, by the way, and he will be arguing that no, the New Testament is not the Word of God. Uh, just a brief bio, uh, Mr. Louis Dizon, the Christian speaker, uh, is a member, a researcher and a writer at the Nicene International Ministries which is a Christian apologetics organization. He's a graduate of the Toronto Baptist Seminary, and he's also a graduate of the University of Toronto, where he studied in the Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations Department. Ijaz Ahmed is a member of the International Quranic Studies Association. He's also a member of the Muslim Debate Initiative, or MDI, and he's also the founder of the popular website callingchristians.com. And uh, he, he won't let you forget that he's from Trinidad because when you hear his accent, you'll be surprised uh, at, at that Caribbean accent. It will transport you to, uh, to Trinidad. Uh, now, as for some uh, basic uh, house rules, because this is a very academic debate, so to be honest with you, it's not really for entertainment. It's, it's a very specific and a very academic kind of debate. And for that, for that reason, we ask that nobody shout out or yell out any of your points. Um, 
Ijaz does not need your help for the debate and Lewis does not need help from the Christians to do the debate because they're both qualified speakers who have really researched this topic very well. Um, also, if you can save your applause or takbir or anything like that for the end, after the speakers have spoken. As for the format of the debate, the, the format of the debate will be that both speakers will speak and give their uh, opening statements, which will be 15 minutes each. Then they will have a round of rebuttals, which will be 10 minutes each. And after that, there will be a 15 minute cross-examination uh, session. After that, we'll break for Salat al-Maghrib, the evening prayer at 8.25. After that, we will uh, resume, we'll have some refreshments, and at about 9 o'clock, hopefully, we will start the audience Q&A. So there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. And then there will be a five minute each clo closing statements on the part of the speakers. And it will be my job as the moderator to make sure that both of the speakers stay strictly within their time limits. So thank you again for attending. Thank you for coming. I hope that it's an informative and a, and a beneficial debate. Uh, hopefully I have not left uh, anything out. Uh, men's washroom is upstairs and women's washroom is downstairs. We don't have a third uh, transgender or pangender washroom just yet. We Muslims are lagging behind on these things. So I'm going to ask uh, Louis then to please come up and do his uh, 15 minutes opening statements by Louis Dizon. Deuteronomy, where both verses are given equal authority. 
there you can see that within the page of the New Testament itself, there is evidence that other writings are treated as scripture. But did the biblical authors regard themselves as writing under inspiration? At least some of the time they didn't indicate that they did. And I'll give you a few examples. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, um, Paul writes, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, um, even you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. So he says that the word that he preaches and writes to them is the word of God. Also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 27, he says, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Now, public recitation of a written document in a religious setting is one of the things that you do with scripture. So a command such as this indicates that he regards his letter as scriptural. And then you have um, the book of Revelation where in the first chapter, verses 10 to 11, it says there, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Theatra, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, some Muslims like to ask their Christian friends, where does the Bible refer to the Bible? And my answer is, it's right here. In the Greek, it says, Biblion which is the word for book here. And it's repeated actually in chapter 22, verse 18 to 19, where um, the author writes, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, to Vibrio Tutu, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away this share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So he regards his book as having a certain holy aura to it that you cannot tamper with. And he even says that certain things are you know, going to happen to you if you do. Interestingly, the command not to add and to subtract is said of the Torah in the book of Deuteronomy and also the book of Proverbs. So there is precedent for this kind of a statement in the Old Testament, and now we see that the New Testament author here um, says the same thing. Now we get to the apostolic message. Now we know what the New Testament authors claim about themselves. We can see how they go about justifying that claim. In Acts chapter 10, verse 39 to 43, you have the apostle Peter writing this, or saying this rather. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So you have the content of the gospel here, Jesus dying and rising again for our sins, and you have the justification for that. The apostles say they are witnesses of this event, and they also appeal to the Old Testament scriptures. It says all the prophets bear witness. This is also repeated in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 8, where Paul says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some, some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the prophets, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So again, you have the same <coughs> message, that the core of the gospel is Christ dying and rising again, and how you know this to be true is that it is written about in the scriptures and that there are those who witnessed it with their own eyes. So you have the apostles' two arguments here, fulfillment of messianic prophecy as well as eyewitness testimony. Um, there are other subtopics that we can get into, such as textual criticism, the canonicity of books of the New Testament, um, whether the different New Testament books are consistent with one another, etc. But I want to focus on these two primarily. 
So, beginning with Messianic prophecy. The concept of the Messiah is a fundamental tenet of all three Abrahamic faiths. So, Judaism and Christianity affirm that the Messiah must fulfill the prophecies of the Hebrew Scriptures. They both affirm that he will be a kingly figure, that his rule will over the whole world, and also that he will suffer for his, his people. That last one probably raised a few eyebrows. Wait a minute, Judaism doesn't teach that. I'd like to refer you to the Jewish, uh, Jewish scholar Daniel Boyarin, who writes in his book, The Jewish Gospels, and I quote, the notion of the humiliated and suffering Messiah was not at all alien within Judaism before Jesus' advent and remained current among Jews well into the future following that. Indeed, well into the early modern period, Jews, it seems, have no difficulty, whatever, with understanding the Messiah who would vicariously suffer to redeem the world. So, modern Jews might not hold to this, but according to the argument, it was actually a reaction towards the development of Christianity. Now, Islam and Christianity both affirm that the Messiah is Jesus. The Quran refers to Jesus as al masih Isa al mari Rasulullah. Um, both Islam and Christianity affirm that he was mistakenly rejected by the Jews, and both affirm that he will come again. Um, let me show you some of the few Old Testament Messianic prophecies. First of all, you have Genesis 49, verse 10, where it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. So right here you see that the Messiah is said to be a kingly figure. Oh, by the way, let me pause right here to say that all the passages that I'm quoting, um, they, are, they are confirmed to be messianic by early rabbinic sources such as the Targums and the Talmud. And I can provide those quotes in my rebuttals if uh, my opponent so wishes. And you also have Micah 5.2, which actually predicts the location of the Messiah's birth. It says, But you, O Bethlehem and Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, uh, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler of Israel, who is coming forth is from old, from ancient days. So here you see that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem, and also that he is going to be, his coming is from old, from ancient days, which indicates pre-existence. And that sets us up for the next major messianic prophecy, and which is this. There's a reason why I put the Hebrew uh, alongside the English. Um, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I know that my opponent here has in the past um, contended this is not a prophecy because he has said that, well, the verbs are actually in the perfect tense. Now, grammatically, the verbs but he and vaikra are perfect tense, but are meant to be understood as future time. This is a Hebrew grammatical phenomenon called the prophetic perfect, and occurs throughout prophetic books, for example, Isaiah 5.14, Jeremiah 23, verse 2, and Amos 5.2. Uh, I can show you numerous Hebrew grammarians who can um, confirm this point. But let me quote just one. Um, Friedrich Wilhelm Gesendis, a classic Hebrew grammarian, says that he, i.e. the prophetic writer, describes the future event as if it had been already seen or heard by him. And finally, of course, skipping that, um, one of the most significant Messianic prophecies is Isaiah verses 213 to 5312. I'm only going to um, show you a bit of the passage there. This is one of the most quoted Old Testament passages in the New Testament. And actually, although most Jews today will argue that it's the people of Israel being described here, uh, most early writings attest this as Messiah. So again, quote from Daniel Boyari. Aside from one very important but absolutely unique notice in Origins Conquer Selsum, there's no evidence at all that any late ancient Jews read Isaiah 52 to 53 as referred to anyone but the Messiah. There are, on the other hand, several attestations of ancient rabbinic readings of the song as concerning the Messiah's tribulations. Now, why is this all significant? Well, you see, this poses problems for both Judaism and Islam. Judaism's problem is it doesn't accept Jesus' Messiahship. 
It solves problems and it does accept Jesus' messiahship, but doesn't grasp the implications of that messiahship. So only the Christian worldview can account for the prophetic continuity between the Old and New Testaments. I see my time is running short, so let me try to run through the remaining uh, material in two minutes. So I wrote this testimony. Uh, John 21, 24, it says here, this disciple was bearing witness about these things, and was written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And also, the same author in 1 John 1, 1 to 2 says, that which what was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, uh, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and claimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest to us. Also, 2 Peter 1.16, I'm not going to read that. Um, and scholars looking at the materials in the New Testament have various criteria for authenticating them. Let me name just three of the most commonly used ones. There's the criterion of embarrassment. Authors of religious documents tend to present their leaders in a positive light and don't generally invent stories that would cast in a negative light. So stories that present the apostles as bumbling idiots or uh, quotes such as, my God, my God, where have you forsaken me? You know, they tend to not be the best kind of quotes uh, for Christians, but the fact that they allow well, these to be it's one minute. It's proof that they were not inventing this. Also, the criteria of dissimilarity, there are certain things that are not from the background of Jesus that are unlikely to be invented. And the criteria of multiple attestation, something in recorded multiple traditions, um, indicate they're likely to be historical. This is similar to the Muslim concept of the Wapur. And this is a problem for Islam because Islam regards Jesus and his disciples to be Muslims. Yet there is no evidence of any proto-Islam in the apostolic period. No matter how far you go into the early history of the church, the theology found there is unacceptable to Muslims. The Islamic worldview cannot account for the development of Christianity. So in conclusion, we all look at the evidence according to worldviews, but at the end of the day, only one worldview can account for all the facts. And my contention here is that Christianity is that one worldview that accounts for all the facts. And hopefully you will consider it and consider the worldview presented by the New Testament. And of the presentation. Thanks, Chris. That's perfect on time. And uh, Brother Jaz Ahmed now will speak. 15 minutes.
Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barri wa salam kathiman kathiwan. So Christians generally believe in two forms of inspiration. Lenary inspiration, which can be understood as conveying the meaning of what is inspired, whereas verbal inspiration can be understood as conveying the exact words that are inspired. However, as we will see tonight, neither view of inspiration can compensate for the history, development, and current state of the New Testament today. Tonight, we will come to understand that the New Testament bears no hallmarks of inspiration, is a product of its time, and is most certainly not God's word. To begin with, there are two main forms of scripture in the performance, that is, the received text and the critical text. The received text refers to the resultant text based on an entire world of Christian Christendom's transmission of the New Testament. It simply means that this version of the New Testament is the one handed down generation by generation to us today. It is the result of the world of Christianity attempting to transmit their scripture. Unfortunately, only a few sects of Christianity believe that they have accurately preserved the New Testament from one generation to the next. That sect of Christianity is not present here tonight. So I have a, to the blue book on my desk here, fortunately I didn't bring it with me. Uh, the book here is referred to as a critical text. A critical text is premised upon the belief that the worldwide community of Christianity was not able to preserve scripture at a competent level. So a critical text is quite simply a recreation of what scholars believe the first New Testament may have looked like. Scholars go through hundreds of manuscripts, analyzing variants to see which is better than the other, and then take all of those variants from all of those manuscripts and they produce a critical text. The term for that method is called the eclectic method, eclectic meaning to gather from a wide range of sources. Now, it's important to answer the question in the debate title tonight. Do Old Testament prophecies prophesy about Jesus? Oh wait, it's, it's the New Testament, the word of God. I confused it, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, well, the answer is no. The critical text is referred to as a voyage text, a prototype text, a hypothetical text. When we read most of the New Testaments today, they tend to be based on the critical text. Christians like Lewis take home their translations and affirm, as Lewis did tonight, that they possess God's will. While ironically, the very scholars that compose Lewis and Scripture don't consider it to be God's will, but a prototype of what the New Testament may have looked like based on the surviving manuscripts. It's important to therefore understand that there is a dichotomy between what Christians want to believe and what the people who assemble their scripture believe. One side believes it's God's will, and the other side throws their hands up in the air and says it could be, it may be, it just might have some of God's will, but we have no certainty. We can't have certainty because we don't have the originals. So based on whatever surviving manuscripts there are, this is the best prototype of today what we could build. At the end of the day, it's still a prototype text. So the question of the debate has been answered. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we were to ask the people that put this scripture together, whether they were inspired by God in some way or the other, the answer you get is no. On page nine of that book, they tell us exactly how they chose one variant reading from one manuscript over another variant reading of another manuscript. Not once did they mention inspiration, guidance from God, praying for answers, God talking to them and letting them know which one is more accurate than the other. None of those things happened. It was purely academic. It's important to understand though that these critical editions have changed over time and we know how much they have changed and what methods were used for compiling them. Right now on my desk I have the 28th edition of this New Testament. It bears the name of Eberhard Nassau. So what was his methodology for compiling the earlier versions of Lewis' scripture? Up until the 26th edition was released in 1979. So 26, I have the 28. So his method was, he had three collections of manuscripts. And whenever two or more agreed, he chose that reading to put in his edition. 
I'm not kidding. Again, it's not a matter of inspiration, guidance from the Holy Spirit of God. It just comes down to which previous publications of the New Testament he chose and which to agree with each other. What's worse though is that Kurt Allen, who worked with Ibrahim Nassau, he worked on two critical editions at the same time. And as that very book testifies, in 1966, the 25th edition of the Little Scripture and the other scripture called the Greek New Testament, that book mentioned specifically that they differed considerably between each other. Just think about that. The same man working on recreating a prototype of the first New Testament ended up recreating two completely distinct, contradictory and different texts. Where was the Holy Spirit then? Where does inspiration fit into that story? An important point to make though is that the scholars of the New Testament who compiled this edition, as I mentioned previously, used the eclectic method. So they put the New Testament together by taking bits and pieces from different manuscripts, from different times, from authors of unknown intention or ability. For all we know, the variants that are used in this critical text today could have originated because someone felt in certain some passage made the stories in the New Testament to be better. We have to remember, as I just mentioned, one of the methods for recreating the New Testament prototype was to choose the more popular writer. Nothing more, nothing less. More people use this version, so it must be true. That's the level of scholarship behind the use of scripture. So as I was saying, today's scholars take different readings from different manuscripts and then paste it all together and produce the use of scripture that is called a critical text. In doing so, they make a very candid confession. The eclectic method is but one method that can be used to recreate a prototype of the New Testament. There's another method that gives you another text. It's called the Diplomatic Edition. The Diplomatic Edition means that scholars use one manuscript in a collection, what we call a codex, or what can be understood as a book. So they use one main book, and when they see that this book is wrong, they indicate where a reading can be taken from a better source. This means that the majority of the text in the book would be accurate, that it had been transmitted correctly, and it may only have minor mistakes which can be fixed. Therefore, it's interesting to note that scholars of the New Testament today don't use that method and that they don't produce that text. It's because there's no collection of the New Testament that has existed within the last 2,000 years that they could rely on as having been transmitted accurately. Can you imagine that? Because no such accurate and valid collection of the New Testament has existed in history, they instead have to choose from hundreds of manuscripts to build a version of the New Testament that no Christian in history has read before. Christians remark that they have thousands upon thousands of manuscripts. Yet what is the worth of those manuscripts when the prototype you read today cannot be seen to exist in any one collection in the entirety of Christian history? In other words, the New Testament of today is not the New Testament of yesterday and it will not be the New Testament of tomorrow. In fact, we may just have to consider if the New Testament itself can be considered sinful. Romans 14, 22 states that everything that does not come from faith is sin. Since the New Testament scholars do not use faith as a guiding principle in editing the New Testament text, we can then consider that because their efforts are not from faith, it is sinful. And so, as a result, the New Testament itself is sinful. When we read the New Testament, are we reading Jesus' words within them? The answer is no. Dan Wallace, as a conservative scholar, he says, begin quote, Scholars have for a long time recognized that the Gospel writers shared their narratives, including the sayings of Jesus. A comparison of the synoptics, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, reveals this on almost every page. The Gospel of Matthew quotes Jesus differently than the Gospel of Mark does, who quotes Jesus differently than the Gospel of Luke does, and John's Jesus speaks significantly different than the synoptic Jesus does. End quote. He goes on to say, the ancient historians were far more concerned to get the gist of what the speaker said than they were to record his exact words. And if Jesus taught mostly or even occasionally in Aramaic, since the Gospels are in Greek, the words by definition are not exact, end quote. So there you have it. 
if we want to know whether or not we have the spoken words of Jesus in the New Testament. Now we know we don't. What we have are first the translations, which were then interpreted and then put on by people we don't know, and then later edited by many other people we don't know. In other words, it is dishonest to claim we have the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Even if we believe that the eyewitnesses wrote the Gospels, and by the way we don't, they too apparently did not care about what Jesus had to say. For example, the Gospel of Mark has Jesus speaking in Aramaic many times. The author of the Gospel of Matthew removes all of the Aramaic saints from his Gospel. He doesn't even bother to translate them. Most of the time, he completely deletes what Jesus had to say. That should itself tell you just how much the early Christians cared about what Jesus had to say. One of the problems with the New Testament is that we don't know what the initial writings of what came to be known as the New Testament contain. We have to remember that we cannot reconstruct a prototype of the New Testament from within the first 200 to 300 years after Jesus. Full copies of the New Testament literature only really appear in the major collections in the 4th century. So when a scholar or someone else says that the Gospels were written in the 1st century, this is practically a guess. It's not based on anything tangible. The scholarly term for this is genealogical projection, and it's completely hypothetical. The scholar N.T. Wright advises us, we don't know when any of the Gospels were written. We do not know when the Gospels were written. We should all repeat that before breakfast, end quote. Tonight, I invite you to read that with us, as if you're after the of Salah. Now, you'll often hear that there are no variants which affect theology, but there are. Dr. James White teaches about Jude 1 5 in court. It is a very difficult variant. There's no question about that. It's probably one of the most difficult variants in all of the New Testament. End quote. He goes on to say, again, quote, that's interesting. Jesus delivers the people of Israel. Well, that has got some pretty important theological ramifications to it. There's no question about that. We also have other errors, for example, in John 9, 38, the text is supposed to read, and I believe Lord, and he worshipped him, end quote. But these words are not found in Papyrus 75, Codex Sinaiticus, W, and these two other Coptic witnesses. Some, someone reading the Gospel of John taught that it didn't teach Jesus as it were directly. Whatever version they had, it apparently did not deify Jesus enough, so they had to invent a story as someone would worship him. <laughs> Then there's John 6.69, it reads, the Holy One of God. But the majority text handed down to us reads, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Again, one tribe or another changed the words to deify Jesus. Remember, this is the Gospel of John, the one that presents the highest form of Christology. And whatever version the earlier Christians used, they had to edit it to make Jesus more of a God. That raises in itself many theological ramifications. I have at least a dozen or more of these, I think, good, but time is very limited. Let's consider then the belief that the eyewitnesses wrote the Gospels. We know from the very New Testament that eyewitnesses can call someone God even if they deny it to their faces. In Acts 14, both Paul and Barnabas denied to the crowds and priests that they were not gods. Yet the people still fully convicted that they were. They even sacrificed animals to them. So even if the unknown authors were eyewitnesses, which we have no proof of, it still does not make their alleged testimonies correct or valid. That's simply the case. Lastly, it's difficult to believe in anything anyone wrote about Jesus in the New Testament when we are led to believe that what we're reading is not God's direct word, but the, but the unknown author's interpretation. One minute. We can't trust the interpretation. For example, Dan Wallace mentions that scholars believe, the early Christians believe, that Jesus was going to return within their generation. Obviously, he didn't, which can be seen as a false prophecy because the only way you can know that this generation does not mean this generation is if this generation passes with our prophecy coming to pass. With respect to the prophecy of his return, two of the signs he mentioned did occur, earthquakes and the destruction of the temple. So their understanding of what Jesus predicted was wrong, and so if we can't rely on their understanding to be correct, how can you expect us to accept this as God's word? In the Gospel of Matthew, Luke and John, Jesus commands the disciples to cross the lake from Bethsaida to Capernaum. But in Mark's Gospel, he tells them to go to Bethsaida in the opposite direction. Are you telling me the eyewitnesses who were testimonies with these errors? 
then how is it God's word when the basic details don't add up? As Michael Lacuna mentions, of a harmonizing this contradiction, that's really difficult, I think, unless you want to engage in theological gymnastics. Thank you. Thank you, Ajaz. And now the first rebuttal by Louis Dizan for 10 minutes. Considerably more baggage this time around. So. <laughs> All right, maybe it comes well. So let's see. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Ejaz, for your. I can't help but notice that almost all of what you presented had to do with the discipline of textual criticism. And that is one of the topics that I do like to research myself. In fact, I want to thank you right now for suggesting to me this book by Bar Ehrman that you said I should look up. I take your book suggestion seriously, so I do precisely that. And I do want to speak on the topic of textual criticism, which I did have a series of slides for, but I didn't have time to present it. Thank you for giving me an excuse to uh, put it up. Now, I want to begin with this quote by C.S. Lewis. The moment a miracle enters nature's realm, it obeys all her laws. Miraculous swine will intoxicate. Miraculous consumption will lead to pregnancy. Inspired books will suffer all the ordinary processes of textual corruption. Miraculous bread will be digested. So if you are of a faith that holds to the view that God gave you divine revelation, then it's better. Okay. Um, if you hold to a faith that where God gives you divine revelation, it is inevitable that the holy book that you hold to will have textual variations in it. Um, Ija is well aware of the fact that there is Quranic textual criticism as well. I'll speak to that briefly later. Um, if you hold to the view that textual variations disqualify a book from being God's word, then why be a theist at all? Because you might as well believe in deism, that God basically has hands off on the world, or be an atheist, not believing in a God, because the moment you hold to a sacred text, you open yourself up to the problems associated with textual criticism. And there are problems. I will not deny that there are. But I think that the problems are a little bit overblown. Uh, if you consider the fact that there are many ancient documents in antiquity, and the New Testament is one of the most well-attested of them, um, you see that the problems really are exaggerated. Uh, I want to present to you this little infographic, which shows you the relative manuscript evidence for various documents in the ancient world. You see that that massive yellow circle there is the manuscript evidence for the New Testament. So it's not just the fact that it is the most well-attested, have the most numerous, uh, 5,800 in Greek and well over 20,000 once you put in the translations. Um, if you look at the center of the infographic, you notice that the yellow circle is very close to the center. That's because there's a very short interval of time between when the original documents were written and when the earliest copies are made available. And none of the early other documents in the ancient world come close to that. Um, Frederick Kenyon, an important scholar in the 20th century, said this, the interval between the dates of the original composition and the earliest extant evidence becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as firmly established. Um, likewise, Bruce Metzger, in his textual commentary on the New Testament, which is the companion text to the critical text that the Jazz has on his table, uh, says this, during the 20th century, with the discovery of several New Testament manuscripts, much older than any that had hitherto been available, it has become possible to produce editions of the New Testament that approximate ever more closely to what is regarded as the wording of the documents. Now, you're gonna pick at that 
little doubt that's in there. Well, it comes close, but it's not exactly the original. Um, I would like to suggest that the amount of doubt that textual critics have in that area is actually very minimal. Um, of the 400,000 plus variants that exist in our manuscript tradition, less than 1% of it actually is either is both significant, i.e. it actually has some bearing on the meaning of the text, and viable, which means it actually has some chance of, you know, being, uh, having a bearing on what the original was. And that's important because while there are all those little details that textual critics work at to determine what the original meaning is, most of the time it only concerns my new show. And you said that, you know, you tried to rebut the claim that no, none of these variants have uh, actually affected the meaning of the text. Funny thing is, this is, a, this is actually not a dispute. It's not just um, Christians who are saying that the wording of the variants does not affect the, um, the doctrines found therein. This is actually what non-Christian scholars say. Um, Bart Ehrman, who is one of the most well-known scholars in this field, says so in his blog, as well as in radio interviews and many other places. So this is something that um, is not really in contest. And to make the point, um, my friend he just talked about the diplomatic text and the critical text, and the main representatives of the two are, if you use a diplomatic text, the King James Version, and if you use the collected text, pretty much any modern version will do, any SD, ESV, etc. Now take a church where both versions exist side by side. Actually, my church is a pretty good example. For a long time, the church I went to had both the King James Version and the ESV side by side. It still does. Um, but the ESV is gaining more ground in my church. Now, my church has never changed any of its beliefs as a result of switching translations. Um, we still preach more or less the same things that we did 50 years ago when the church was founded and we were using the King James Version. I teach a catechism class in that church, and our catechism comes with various proof texts found in the footnotes. Aside from the fact that I can't use the Kama Yohanyam anymore, the catechism footnotes had that, and I can't use Acts 8.37 as a proof for baptism, credo baptism, I mean. Um, there, there isn't really anything significant in there. Now, you said that, yes, there are some variants where, depending on the reading that you take, it might present a higher Christology, but the fact is, whether you use a diplomatic text or a critical text, you're still going to arrive at more or less the same Christology. I highly doubt that if you were using King James Version, you would have a harder time defending the deity of Christ or the Trinity as opposed to somebody doing the exact same thing from the NASB or the ESV. <clears throat> anyway, let me speak a little bit more on textual criticism. Um, uh, those of you who are unaware uh, of the name Mark Erdman should probably look him up because he is one of the most well known scholars in the field. And a lot of Muslims refer to him in order to present a case against the reliability of the New Testament. But I want to suggest to you that the facts uh, should be separated from the conclusions that were made from those facts. Uh, Bart Ehrman says, for example, in page 177 of uh, Misquoting Gene, Jesus, his famous landmark work, it's probably safe to say that the copying of early Christian texts was by and large a conservative process. Scribes, whether or not professional scribes in the early centuries or the professional scribes of the Middle Ages, were intent on conserving the textual tradition they were passing on. Their ultimate concern was not to modify the tradition, but to preserve it for themselves and for those who would follow them. Most scribes, no doubt, tried to do a faithful job in making sure that the text they reproduced was the same text they inherited. So he's saying here that, by and large, uh, the scribes didn't do their level best to conserve text that they had, and the places where there was intentional editing, the kind that um, Ejaz tries to make much of, are actually the exceptions rather than the rule. Lastly, One moving minute. out of textual criticism into the topic of eyewitness testimony, why would you say that 
The fact that the words of Jesus, although in Aramaic were written in Greek, somehow militates against them being the true words of Jesus. Now, as a Muslim, you believe that the prophet's words, you know, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, etc., um, were recorded in Arabic in the Quran. And I don't think any of those prophets spoke Arabic, but I don't think you use that as grounds for denying that the words attributed to them in the Quran are true words. And as for Matthew dropping the Aramaic wording, that is a purely stylistic thing. Like, why does the fact that you transliterate as a person translate affect the um, reliability of these sayings? I don't understand the thinking that is going on behind this. And I don't have time to rebut the accusation of sexual corruption, but I do want to name drop a book. Uh, if you want to go into more detail on that, there is a book by Craig Longberg called The Historical Reliability of the Gospels, where he demonstrates that most of these alleged contradictions are in fact not so once you really go into detail on the um, specifics of the historical circumstances of the various passages involved. Thank you, Lewis. And now Ijaz will give a rebuttal for 10 minutes. Of the temple. 
the rest might say, but it's so much big of an event, the writers would not have missed writing that in the text. But we have the Gospel of Thomas and the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. In fact, I have an entire book there with apocryphal Gospels, and none of them mention the destruction of the temple, even though we know that they were written in the second century. So to use these posts as testing the veracity of the New Testament just does not make sense. For example, you put in First Thessalonians, um, chapter 2, verse 13. It's omitted in uh, Codex D, Codex F, G, H, K, L. I'm sure that you could go down because you can check it there. You went on to say, uh, what's that like? Six months later. So you said, uh, the eyewitnesses of the apostles and disciples are true because they witnessed it. Brothers and sisters, just because someone said they witnessed something does not make it true. You need to understand that. When you have four monomous writings, like first and second Peter, or for example, Colossians, Ephesians, uh, Second Thessalonians, and Titus, when you have these documents and you know that they were written by someone, an unknown person, in Paul's name, then you know it's not eyewitness testimony. Uh, for example, I'll give you a few examples here. So Lewis wanted to quote. Okay, so he says, no prophecy of scripture comes from any interpretation. But we know that what we have is not the direct words of God in the New Testament. It's the interpretation itself. So to say that no prophecy of scripture can come from interpretation, when the very scripture itself is an interpretation, is a contradiction. So I don't see how you can harmonize those differences. You can't say that no prophecy can't come from any interpretation, when the very text itself is an interpretation. So you went to talk about textual criticism, right? So you said any scripture will have textual variants. I accept that, right? But it does not mean that we have to accept the variants as being correct or true. For example, we have the Mutawati testimony of the Quran. You don't have that for the New Testament. At the very best, it's a hard shell. The very first manuscripts come from the late second century. They don't manifest themselves in the first century, so it's a problem. Uh, you want to say, uh, there are problems in the text that you do not deny. I'm okay with that, Bruce, but the very fact that there are problems that you have to accept means that scripture in and of itself is unreliable. He says, uh, you compare the ancient documents, you put up a lovely graph, uh, and you, mention, you compare the New Testament to those ancient documents. Would those ancient documents get you into heaven? Are those ancient documents part of your theological belief? So here's, here's the scale here. The scale here are pagan authors, Greek authors, and then the word from God. He is equating the word of God with pagan authorship and saying, oh, God is similar. Just because they're similar historically, there's not that one validates the other. You don't go to the works of Homer, you don't go to the works of Aristotle, and claim that that will get you in paradise. That's completely different. The word of God is different from the word of man. To say that your scripture is on the same level as the word of man is an insult to God, to be quite honest. You said that uh, the originals were written within a very short time of the copies. How do you know that when you don't have the originals? That's just hypothetical as empty it by itself. So this is more of a hypothetical game than anything else. You said that they have very little doubt in the text, it's less than 1%. Okay. Do you have UBS4? UBS4 is the United Bible Society's fourth critical edition. More than 50% of the text that they have in the variants is considered doubtful. That's more than 1%. That's 50%. You do know that, right? Let's move on. You said uh, Bruce Metzger uh, says that the editions are approximately closely to the very first words. You don't have the wordings, so how do you know that? That is just pure guesswork. I would like Lewis to tell me, how does he know what the original said when we don't have them? You don't have any from the first century. When we look at the Quran, it's a look of ours in the Quran. We want the New Testament to stand on its own legs. When you compare the Quran with the New Testament, we have documents from the first century, an entire codex, codex stock copy. So I think it's ridiculous to say that you have approximate editions with the initial wording, but you have never seen the initial wording. Uh, you moved on to say, uh, Okay. So you said that your church reads both texts and you have the same teachings. Lewis, uh, your parents are Roman Catholic, right? Yeah. Do, do they read it? What Bible do they read? They don't read the Bible. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the Roman Catholic church has a Bible, yes? 
I mean, they have different theology. Yes. Right, so you're trying to say here that your church is the exception to the rule. But we know, we do know that there are many churches with many Bibles with many different beliefs. The Catholic Orthodox, for example, the Catholic Orthodox Church has a different belief to the Roman Catholic Church, which has a different belief to the Protestant sect. So I don't see how your church is the exception to that. Uh, you won't want to say that, um, uh, what I find strange here, uh, that so you say when it comes to the Quran, sorry, to Matthew, you say Matthew dropping his Aramaic saying is purely stylistic. Didn't he read Deuteronomy 6 4 for us, which says, do not add or delete the words of God, but all of a sudden it's now stylistic. So God says, do not delete all the words, but now it's just stylistic. It's okay if it's style. I don't think I can, how you can reconcile those beliefs. Either it's wrong to read God's word, or it's time. One minute. Yeah, I'll, no question, that's not my time. There wasn't really much to respond to because I find it difficult to understand how a debate on is the Testament God's word. My friend went to the Old Testament. Did I get the wrong fly? I, I got the right fly, right? So, did you get the right fly? What fly did you I just need to make sure because I can't prepare to discuss the New Testament. Did you get the wrong fly? You did? Okay, well, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to have to change it. So, <laughs> so that's it for the rest of my time. Okay, thank you, Jazz. So, before Salat on Monday, now the, the last session we have before Salat is the cross examination, which is 15 minutes to, total. And uh, did you want to do one question each? I was thinking half the time he's asking questions here, half That was, I don't know, that's how most cross examinations work. Right? Okay, so that'll be like seven and a half minutes yeah. of him asking you questions. Yeah, that's what I was Seven and a half minutes of you asking him questions. Okay. Yeah, just turn it off. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter how long we answer. It takes as long as we stay total seven and a half minutes. I don't want to take up most of you as a So if you ask me a question, how much time do I have to answer? Um, I don't know. As much as you need to give to give the answer justice. Okay, so if you ask me one question, I'm take seven minutes. <laughs> seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We didn't read it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, who will be asking this? Ah, sure, sure, um, Okay, first question I want to ask right off the bat. Um, Ijaz, if we had the original autographs, suppose I had them in my bag right here and I showed them to you, hypothetical scenario, would you accept those original autographs as being the Word of God? Why would I have to accept it as the Word of God just because it's the original? Just because you have the original documents does not make it the Word of God. That's the only reason I'm right. So, having the original documents on hand will not actually um, change your view of the scriptures. Now, do you apply that to all 27 books of the New Testament, or are there some of those books that you were willing to believe might be the Word of God in its original form? Okay, so for example, we have the teachings of Judas and Gossius, who said that they got their beliefs of Paul, and I believe both of them had heretical beliefs about Jesus. So, hypothetically speaking, based on the earliest belief of some of the heretics and their attributions to Paul, I will reject the Testament beliefs. But that's, um, no, I meant like the actual documents, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans. Yeah, actually. but now you're assuming that there could be a Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are you aware that those names are hypothetical? No, I'm, I'm not referring to the authorship, I'm referring to the documents as they stand. Okay, so like how, how would I know that they do autographs? No, no, okay, you're not understanding the question. Suppose, you know, we had an original autograph of the Gospel of Matthew. Whether, whether it's Matthew or not is not the point right now. The fact is, if I have the original on hand and I present to you and say this is the word of God, you know, would you accept it? How are you making that qualification? What do you want me to accept? No, the, the text as it is, not you know, a text as it has been attributed to Matthew, or text as it has been copied over the ages. Yeah, but I wouldn't know what that original says, and I don't need you. That, that hypothetical question is a bit silly. No offense. You're asking me to accept that it might be the word of God based on me not knowing what it says. Okay, you know what? Um, we'll yeah, it's move to a different topic. So, how much? So for you know, so for a document claiming to be a word of God, have a reasonable claim to be the word of God, it is your contention that it must actually be. You know, how much variation do you allow for for the word of God to be copied before it is no longer the word of God? It could be 100%, it could have 100% deviations, 
but at the end of the day, there must be some tradition which verifies that those, you can sift through the variations. You just don't want to have the variations by themselves. You need to have some kind of method. You need to have some like textual background. You need to have some oral tradition that takes you back to the originals. Okay, so you are, based on what you have said at this point, I take it that you hold to the view that a diplomatic text is superior to an eclectic text? In your case, it would be, but it would have to mean that the diplomatic text reflects the orthographic text. And as much as we know about the majority text, it does not reflect the orthographic text, which is why you have the eclectic traditions. So one contradicts the other, so the argument is void. Now this is where I make the connection to Quranic textual criticism. Would you say that the Quran, uh, as you have it in your hands, is a diplomatic text? No, it's an orthographic text. Are you confused? A uh, diplomatic text will only come under, under a critical text. The text we have of the Quran is a majority text, a received text, not text as critical. It's text as receptors. You understand the difference, right? Okay, you can't okay. Have Okay. Um, anyway, I did say at the beginning it was going to happen at some point. Um, now, is it your contention that the received text then is superior to either diplomatic or uh, critical text? For which religion? Um, in general, for any book like this is different. I'm trying to apply the same standard to the New Testament and to the Quran. You so. can't do that, there are two different books. Why would you? It's like applying the same uh, methodology to a book of fantasy. And when it's about facts, you can't apply this methodology to both of them, obviously. Well, the reason why I'm using that is because certain textual critics actually have weighed in on it. For example, you know, you're familiar with Rodefoss Westport. Oh, sorry, Westcott. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the man behind the Westcott. original critical text. Yeah, Westcott. Yes, so Westcott actually spoke on Quranic textual criticism. And he said this, uh, this is from the book Some Lessons of the Revised Version of the New Testament. He said, uh, when Caliph Uthman fixed the text of the Quran and destroyed all the old copies which differed from its standard, he provided for the uniformity of subsequent manuscripts at the cost of their historical foundation. And this is the point quote. A classical text which rests firm finally on a single archetype is that which is open to the most serious suspicions. So he's referring to a text such as what you have in the Quran. Do you agree with the criticism of Westcott? Just to verify, this is the same West Coast of Hort when they couldn't decide on the variants, they did conjectural emendation. Come again? This is the same West Coast of Hort when they couldn't decide on New Testament textual variants that they committed conjectural emendation. So, in the case of West Coast of Hort, the scholar is appealing to when they looked at variants in the New Testament tradition and they couldn't figure out which variation was true, they just made up their own. So, it's called conjecture, a lie, or an evidence, emendation to change or improve. So these are the people you are talking to. Well, with all due respect, sir, that is a uh, red herring. All right, so the red herring is that the people who would be willing to insert new changes into their scripture are the same people who should comment on the Quran. Correct? So let me answer the question you asked. Uh, Caliph would want to strike uh, the old copies. Uh, if it depends on a single archetype, then it's open to suspicion. Why is it open to suspicion? Because how do you know that the text that was produced is actually the art? Original autograph. Because we have a full century codex of it. Well, how do you know? You're familiar that there are non automatic streams of yes, and You are aware that if something that is minimal uh, conflicts with the traditional mass transmission, you don't take a minimal text. So, so for example, when I go through this critical edition of the testaments, do they list the minor variants that contradict the major, or did they remove it from this edition? They don't consider minor changes to impact this text. They only contain the major changes that are of concern. So that question is just irreconcilable. <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat that? I had trouble understanding half of it. Your I was question, not trying to be offensive. Your, your question does not make sense. Okay. What but, about the suspicious? No, no, I, what I don't understand is why you don't think that it makes sense. Because I think that the uh, suspicions that are being raised are entirely reasonable ones. What is the suspicion that you're raising? I don't know. That if you have one archetypal text, one received text dominating over all the others, how do you know that the received text that 
was promulgated is actually the original, as opposed to all the competing text types that Because we have one have. major mass transmission that goes back to an actual textual record. Isn't that, um, isn't that kind of circular reasoning? Like, no, you're asking me how can I confirm the major transmission, mm -hmm. and I can because we have a text that goes back to the mm -hmm. first century. That same text is the one that we cite today, as Dr. Atta Coolidge wrote in his paper, from Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim to Minal Jamti wa Nas. He confirmed it. So it's his turn to ask. All right. Uh, yeah. So now, Ijaz will ask you his questions for the next seven and a half minutes. OK, so Lewis, would you agree with Michael O'Connor when he speaks about the contradictions with the feeling of the 5,000? That it's really difficult, I think, unless you want to engage in hermeneutical gymnastics. Uh, what about the feeding of the 5,000? Okay, are you aware that they said that they go to two different areas? Either they go to that side or they come from it? <clears throat> I haven't looked in depth on that. Honestly, I haven't looked and studied that in depth, so I can't comment so on that. So you have read the New Testament, yes? Yeah, right here. Right, okay. And you read those portions with that contradiction and you didn't think about it. So you don't think about when your book has contradictions? <laughs> anyway, some of these things are only apparent, like, again, I'm not an expert at harmonizing apparent contradictions, but I know having done some cursory reading on the topic that if you look at various harmonizations, there are usually um, details, historical, geographical, that once they shed light on the context of these passages, they demonstrate that it's not really in fact real. I don't know the so the context. details are not real, that's what you want to say. Come again? The details are not real, that's not what I'm you not saying mean. that. I'm saying that there might be more going on than what is apparent in the So context. scripture isn't giving you what's apparently going on. What then gives you tells you what's apparently going on? Doesn't give what? What apparently tells you what's going on with that contradiction. No, okay, so can you point out to me where the passage is? I'll, I'll let me take a look. So you need the Muslim to tell you where the feeling of the five thousand is? You know what? Contrary to popular belief, my proof text game is not actually. Likewise, I have a horrible memory, and they will write it down in front of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> you have to search for it. <laughs> but you have to explain to me do you agree or not with Michael Lugolo that you have to engage in hermeneutical gymnastics to solve that contradiction? Well, no, I wouldn't, because um, claims like that are in the eye of the beholder. I, anyone can claim something like that. Like, something can be perfectly reasonable. Uh, to one set of people, and they can be unreasonable to another set, depending on the presuppositions. But I don't want you to say something with the alleged analysis. Some things can be reasonable and apparent, some things may not. So, let's just move on here. Uh, how much time do I have left? Fine, I'll tell you the time. Okay, so, Lewis, um, just a quick question here. How do you know what the originals look like when you don't have the originals? <clears throat> um, let me see. How do I... Honestly, the problem is textual criticism is such a complex topic that it's hard to give a canned answer to it. But basically, um, all of the methods of textual criticism, the comparison of manuscripts, uh, finding out what, it, you know, what readings are the most geographically dispersed, dispersed um, and which ones are the oldest, and which ones make more sense when you uh, compare the variants to see which one might have reasonably given rise to all the other readings. When you compare all those other things, you can uh, dis discern what the original text is. And I do hold to the view that we do have the original text in those manuscripts, not even if it's not necessarily in any single one manuscript, because if you're familiar with the concept of tenacity, um, the original never really disappears. There might be variants that will compete with it, but the original will still always be there. How does that answer my question? I'm asking you, how do you know you have the originals when you've never read them? You're saying that you copy the textual criticism. The textual criticism doesn't tell you what the original is. It only tells you what it could be. And you're familiar with John 116, correct? You're familiar with Carmel? Yeah. Right. Carmel also says that you can't know what the originals are without seeing them. So how do you make a distinction when, hold on, when a scholar of the Greek disagrees with you? The original of which passage did you say? Of the New Testament. No, which particular passage did you say? You I, I didn't cite any testament. Oh, sorry. I said if you're familiar with Caldwell from Caldwell Jew, oh, right. 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 So he agrees with the Muslims. You can't know what the original is without seeing it in the first place. Would you like me to quote it for you? Correct, correct. Yeah, I will. 
a second, it's on my Facebook. <laughs> so to continue this, right? So please answer my question. How does textual criticism get you to the original when textual critics themselves, so this lovely book, are uh, a user's guide to the National Alert 20 in Greek Testament by the Society of Public Literature? They tell me that this book is only a hypothetical master text. How do you make the jump from the hypothetical to the actual? The reason why textual critics will say, well, this is only probably the uh, close to the original text is because people in academia generally are not in the habit of making dogmatic claims about what is certainly the case. It might be that the level of doubt um, is actually very minimal, but because there is even just the slightest bit of doubt, they will not say that they know from the actual okay. certainty. So when you read this book, it says hypothetical master copy. He doesn't say that some verses are more reliable than the others. But he, the entire New Testament is hypothetical. Let me read for you what he says here. He says between 5,500 and 6,000 handwritten copies were text from the New Testament are known today, and that number continues to increase. But he goes on to say there is hardly a sentence of the New Testament that has the exact same wording in each of these exemplars. So we're not discussing uh, diacritics, we're looking at the continental skeletal text. They don't have the same wording. So how can you determine that when none of them go back to the first or the second century? You are familiar, you are aware of the fact that the majority of those variants that are listed there are neither viable nor significant, right? Neither viable nor significant is 50% of what this other thought about your testament of the UBS or you know that, right? Yeah. Well actually if you look at the variants that are both viable and significant, they they make up at most about 1% of all those variants. Okay, how did you reach out that uh, number? When, what is the methodology you use? Can you please explain it? Um, honestly, if you go through every single one of those variants, you find that most of them are insignificant. You're familiar with what the most um, common textual variant is, right? The Google knew, where some variants will have the letter N and you have a certain word and others won't. Um, I hope you're not trying to suggest to me that the fact that most writers can't decide whether to put the letter N or not at the end of the word uh, mitigates uh, the claim of that text to be the word of God. If you were listening to me, I did not say about diacritical marks, but well done. Uh, I was asking you about the uh, the text. So let's get to the question. You say when you go through the text to variants, you can decide. But obviously, you haven't gone through the text to variants, so that claim of one percent is false. I asked you about the 5,000, and you said you haven't gone through that. So again, you yourself didn't go through these variants, how do you arrive at that number? And you simply go to someone else without verifying it for yourself. Do you, wait, are you actually expecting me to go through every single one of the variants? Do you care about scripture? Well, of course I do. But the fact is, there are other people doing that already. And most of the results are actually very well established. Okay, and and these people, when they go through the variants, is the Holy Spirit in the case of what is the word of God from what is not the word of God? And again? When these people go through the variants, are they determining what is the word of God from what is not the word of God? Well, that depends on the meaning of the word determined, because the word determined can actually have two meanings, either like deciding or like finding out. The, try to you know, distinguish between those two senses of the word determined. Uh, okay, thank you to both of the speakers for that cross-examination. And we're coming to the time for Maghrib prayer, which is the evening prayer. Uh, the prayer space for both the men and women is downstairs. For those of you who came late to our guests, the men's washroom is upstairs, and women's washroom is downstairs. And we don't have a third transgender or transgender uh, washroom yet. Um, and so after Salat al uh, we will resume at, a, at about 10 to 9. Uh, at 8.45, 8.50, we'll resume. There'll be some light refreshments at the back for you, and uh, then there will be a 25-minute audience Q&A, question and answer session. So you'll have an opportunity to ask Ijaz, the Muslim speaker, or Louis, the Christian speaker, questions that you have relating to the topic. So I uh, hope to see you back here at about 10 to 9. Inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu and welcome back. The last session of this debate before the closing statements is the audience Q&A. So now you have an opportunity to ask the speakers questions. In case you forgot their names, there's uh, Ijaz on my right, Ijaz is the Muslim speaker, and Louis on my left is representing the Christian side. So. Um, 
if, uh, so if you want to line up, uh, there's a mic which is set up there in the middle. And what I would ask before you line up, just to, since there's more Muslims in the audience, and perhaps all of the questions might end up being for Lewis, and that wouldn't be quite fair. So if I can ask, if you could please, when you line up at the mic, um, if, 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 the, uh, if the questions for Ijaz could line up a little bit on this side of the mic, and if your questions are for Lewis, if you could uh, line up on this, the other side of the mic, and that way we can get one question each. Or at least we will try to do that, ideally. We'll try to get one question each, if there's enough people for both sides. Uh, and uh, so you can line up now if you like. And uh, please, uh, when, you, uh, when you ask your question, just make it clear, is the question for Ijaz or is the question for Lewis? And please do ask a question, and not a long lecture. I agree with the moderator. Which is, um, two minutes, two minutes. Uh, do we spot the events? Do we separate speaker events? Yeah, if, if, if my two minutes are up, just tell me to shut up. And then the other speaker can also respond? Do sure. I have that time? Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. It's that's that's time. Okay. So the speakers will have two minutes to respond, and then the other speaker can also add in something for up to one minute. Uh, so the question is, what is your name? Uh, who are you? Where are you going? These are examples of good questions, uh, not long statements. No questions about whether a mortgage is halal <laughs> or whether uh, the burger patties at McDonald's are halal. That would be a great debate too for a different night. Okay, so please, uh, first questioner can uh, can uh, come up to the speech. Uh, my question is related to our topic today. Uh, I would like to ask Brother Louis that uh, I want to talk about the figures, the numbers. In Africa, we have uh, many, oh, I could say in Africa, we have compared com, uh, the number of learned, educated Christian scholars accept Islam more than any other religion like Muslim scholars convert to change to Christianity, but we have the number, a bigger number of Christian scholars educated, some of them educated in Vatican, some educated in uh, Italy and many uh, Christian dominated countries. Why they convert to Islam, many of them comparing to other religions? Okay. So the question for Lewis is why are there uh, Christian Africans and Christian African scholars converting to Islam. Uh, but after this, again, I'll ask that out of respect for the topic, that we keep the questions also relevant to the topic, which, as a reminder, is the New Testament. Is the New Testament the Word of God? Yeah, Do you mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I can also speak to that briefly. I don't know that it actually is the case that more people are converting to Islam than any other religion. Um, it is often claimed that Islam is the fastest growing religion, but uh, based on most statistics that I know, that's due to natural birth rates rather than conversions. Um, so the, the question itself is based on the assumption that more people are converting to Islam um, than any other religion, which you can't really, you can't really confirm that that's the case. But be that as it may, yes, I, have, I am familiar with various you know, people who say they were Christians, some of whom claim to have been former clergy who have converted to Islam. Now, we recognize that the opposite is true. So, the re it's not so much the conversions as the reasons given for converting. And I have to say, having listened to a lot of testimonies of people who have converted to Islam and comparing them with testimonies of people who converted to Christianity, I have noticed a qualitative difference in the conversions. The, uh, I'm sure you guys will disagree with me, but I found that the reasons former Muslims give for converting to Christianity uh, have generally been much more cogent and well thought out and, you know, based on deep uh, meditation on the issues involved. Um, but it's strictly anecdotal, like, unless you can provide me with raw hard statistics to work on, I can't really say much more to that. 
I'll just quickly respond. Uh, well, I can't comment on the number, but I will comment on what Lewis said. He said that there are qualitative reasons in, conversion, in conversions, Christian conversion, conversions, were cogent and well thought of. I wonder if that includes the new Croatian who dreamed Jesus and dreamed, uh, who fell out thousands of courses appearing to him. I wonder how well thought out and cogent that conversion is.
When we discovered the virus, you mentioned 252, but that's not the only one. In fact, we have discovered a plethora of um, manuscripts that go closer. Well, P52 is the one that changed all the other dates. It's the fifth one. No, 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 no. P52 changed the dating specifically um, from a scholar named um, C.F. Fowler, who proposed that the um, that the Gospel of John was a second century attestation, and he did so by using a Galen dialectic. Uh, even though it's a fascinating discussion, but I'll just suggest maybe if you give a final word or a final thought on that, and then we can move on to the next question. Okay. Um, so it's easy to say that the vast majority of people agree with something. If they are convinced that these are the originals, why don't they believe in it? You claim to ask the one believe it's 99.9%, but he rejects it. So if the sexual critics themselves are atheists, and they reject this work of scripture, then they believe it's 99.9% accurate, what is the use of belief if it's accurate when they reject it as from God? What's the point? They're not convinced, that's why. Okay. Uh, next question. I do have a few things to say. One is that what you just heard on this play here is a form of hyper-skepticism that if you really follow it to its logical conclusion, um, you can't really know what any text says, and if you can't know what any text says, why be a theist? Because then you can't rely on any book to be God's word. Um, that being said, let me just say a little bit about the authorship. If you throw out P52, which you know you have every right to, you still have to deal with patristic evidence. Um, I have read through most of the Apostolic Fathers, I have them right here, and I was perusing the writings of Ignatius of Antioch, who died um, some either 106 or 117 AD, and I counted up the number of places where he quotes the Gospel of John, and there are at least six different places where he does that. Uh, so that by itself establishes an upper limit for when the gospel could have been written. And as for the statistic, 99.8%, uh, I don't know if anyone here knows what the idea of a conjectural emendation is. Uh, he just alluded to it briefly. Basically, it's the idea that the original reading must not be in any of the extant manuscripts. Now, there are literally one or two places where uh, people like Herman and Metzger think that a conjectural emendation might be necessary. But even then, um, these concern minor details like a spelling variant. And also, some other scholars, such as those who might advocate uh, more of a Byzantine priority position, would say that conjectural emendations are not necessary at all. All of the readings are found in the excellent manuscripts. Okay. Thanks, Thanks to uh, Next question. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Presentation tonight, and Lewis as well. Uh, my question is I'll first say, if I could just back up and say the statement. If I was a Muslim and believe the NGO was given by God, uh, given by Allah, uh, but then was allowed to be corrupted to the extent that you claim that it has, uh, I think my confidence that God will preserve other scriptures would be shaken, including the Quran. Uh, why would I? How could I think that God had allowed previous scriptures to be corrupted, but be so certain that the Quran had not been corrupted? So my question is why are you at all concerned that God has allowed previous scriptures to get corrupted in a serious way that you claim um, that God, that Allah could have allowed the Quran to be corrupted as well? Yeah, so this is two minutes. Uh, two minutes, sorry. Yeah, so that's a fundamental misstep. Yeah, okay, so that's a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of scripture. That should be enough. <laughs> yeah, so all, in Islamic beliefs, all the other scriptures before the Quran. I'm, I guess the problem was me. <laughs> so, right, so, right, so all the other scriptures before the Quran were meant to be temporary. So consider the Noahide laws. Before the Noahide laws came, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sex between siblings, incest, sorry. <laughs> incest was allowed. That was a temporal thing. It stopped. Again, you move to the mosaic laws. Those are not put in market today. You don't have to follow them. So all those laws were temporal. It only makes sense that the laws which will be determined for eternity set in stone are the ones that will be reserved. And the Quran actually says in Surah 2 that God, uh, whatever he uh, 
other kids, it may be causes to be forgotten or lost. And so that makes sense. You don't want to have two theologies competing when the Quran especially designates itself as the last revelation. So that abrogates all the other previous revelations. So that to me makes sense rather than having the confusion with Christianity. You have some Christians that still follow the Testament laws and if they're ritually, that's a confusion among people that we need to sort out. Islam prevents that by not having the original, not having the previous scriptures authenticated. Just a quick question on stand by left. Half a minute. Very quickly, uh, Lewis says that, uh, yes, um, the patristic evidence that you can get um, with the building you just went from, just to warn him, it's actually down the one that says you can't do that with the patristics. You still have to go centuries later, and he specifically mentioned in July 18th the later uh, church fathers, so not the early church fathers, so not, not the early to be able to one. One minute. I will try to do justice to Daniel Wallace by quoting his exact words. Um, and this is what he said. The ancient church fathers quoted so often from the New Testament that it would be possible to reconstruct almost the entire New Testament from their writings alone. All told, there are more than more than one million quotations in the New Testament of the writings, made as early as the first century, continuing through the thirteenth century. So they're extremely valuable for determining the wording of the New Testament text. And then Wallace is not alone in that. I would like to point out that Metzger and Barter in, in the text of the New Testament says the exact same thing. They've said if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient for the um, patristic quotes, I mean, for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. Now, that being taken out of the way, I want to speak really uh, briefly on this idea of abrogation. And um, you're going to have to tune in to the next debate um, where I will prove to you that the Quran does not. Uh, teach the abrogation of the previous scriptures. Um, but you, I think you're a little bit confused as to the in-house debates that Christians have regarding the continuity of the Old Testament. And yes, there are disagreements among us on that issue, but all the presuppose that the Old Testament is the word of God and that it relates to the New Testament in some way. Um, Marcin aside, and he really is the odd man out in this um, discussion. There is no Christian on the planet who will say that the Old Testament is the law of the word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Thank you. My question is for uh, Brad Lewis. You said the New Testament, the words of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. They were inspired by God. But from the Old Testament, when God spoke to people or to prophets, there was a medium. Is that not true? There is a what? A medium. Medium. Yes. Could you elaborate on that? The medium, God himself was in appear before his prophets. He sends an angel to speak to, to them, including them, when in Gabriel, Gabriel appears to her and she said, if you fear God, please stay away from me. For all these people you have quoted, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where did they get their inspiration from? Please tell me. Well, and also, Yes, it's all questions. Let's, let's just do one question for now. Okay. So where did Mark, Matthew, Luke, John get their inspiration from? Oh, um, John 14, the upper room discourse, Jesus says that he will send his spirit on the disciples and will remind them and will teach them all things. And that is how they obtain, you know, the inspiration to write the books that um, they wrote. And um, at this point, I do want to clarify the misconception that the Jez Bogdan's rebuttal regarding how inspiration works. It's not one's own interpretation as in, you know, the author um, invents an interpretation and then puts it down on paper. What it means is, it is not purely human agency. If you look at the rest of the verse, it says they were carried along by the Holy Spirit to uh, say or write the things that they wrote. And also, you seem to be of the opinion that 
Um, there is only one method of inspiration, which is mechanical dictation. And there are times when God does uh, give verbatim the words that he wants the authors to recite. For example, in the Old Testament prophets, you have the sayings that begin with the saying, Koha Mar Adonai, thus says the Lord. And you also have the Revelation where, um, where the angel instructs the, um, John to write the writings that he saw in the book. Um, but most of the time, inspiration doesn't work that way. Even in the Old Testament, you know, the Psalms were not given by dictation. The psalmists uh, wrote out of their spirit, but their spirit was in tune with the Spirit of God as they wrote them. The Madrid of No, now we'll no, no, let the Jaws answer. You can line up again and ask another question if you like, please. Uh, so, just quickly to what Louis said earlier, uh, just referring to, a to our text, you're going to go for my own. I'm one. With that, what is on that woman? They say, actually, no, I didn't say what the woman said, and that's God said that virtually the entire testimony can be reconstructed on the basis of the writings of the church fathers. Early is the key word I do not use. That view was based on a misunderstanding through the pattern. You mentioned the first to 13th century, it's close to the 13th. Going on, Roman himself says that uh, he actually mentions it's very much a pity that there were not good sources for the first to 13th century. So, again, not the century. I don't know where you get that from. I have the exact words here. As for the inspiration of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when the Gospels use the word Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't refer to a single author. Those identities were identified later by Arabians, I think, in 185 CE. And just to make it clear, when textual biblical scholars refer to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't refer to one person. They refer to a collection of unknown tribes and authors. These names of who we call homonymous names or common names are willing to attribute it to these writings. Uh, I believe Lewis himself told me that he believed the names of these authors were inspired. Um, he had to prove that. I don't know how many stuff can prove Thank you. Uh, next question. Brother uh, Lewis, uh, this question to Brother Lewis. Um, I don't think it's relevant to the topic today, but as, as I learned that he's a Christian graduate, I have a question for him. Uh, we in Africa we have dialogue like this years and years ago, and um, we Muslim pose the question to our Muslim uh, Christian friends that uh, where in the Bible, which page in the Bible, uh, Jesus said, "I am God and worship me." We put this question to our Christian friends. Many years ago, they couldn't answer this. Maybe because he's a Christian graduate, uh, he can answer this. Where in the Bible is written, Jesus said that I am your Lord and worship you. Can you can you give me the Are you going to answer it now or later you can speak uh, with him? It's your choice. Yes, you can answer it. Well, maybe, yeah, yeah, okay. We're going to get into a debate about the deity of Christ again. What is supposed to get made about the New Testament? Every topic just gets brand in there, but okay, um, and I'm going to go with the Gospel of Mark because a lot of people claim, like to claim it has the Lewis Christology, um, and despite that, you can't get uh, past the end of the second chapter without getting all these exalted claims Jesus makes for himself, he claims he can forgive sins, when the um, Pharisees present say, who can forgive sins with God alone? Well, technically they're not just saying it, they were thinking in their heads, but Jesus knew that they were thinking which is funny because in the Old Testament it says only God is able to do that and he was able to reply to the thoughts in their heads. And at the end of the second chapter of Mark, um, Jesus you know, um, violates what the, the, the Pharisee interpretation of the Sabbath and um, Jesus replies to that saying the Son of Man is born even of the Sabbath. And I've heard some interesting attempts to get around that. The most recent I've heard from Shabir Ali in his debate with Samuel Green on this very topic, um, he tried to explain the way by saying, the Son of Man, that context just refers to humanity in general, and yet that usage of the um, usage of Son of Man is unparalleled in all of the Gospel of Mark. And as long as we're on the topic of the Son of Man, look up Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62, where the high priest asks, um, Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus replies, I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven and see the right hand of power. I can't picture that verse.
verse, but it's a quotation of Daniel chapter 7, where a divine figure is presented. Uh, he is called the Son of Man, and he is said to have dominion over uh, all of the world, and he's given worship, etc. And funny enough, um, I ran into this recently. People say that this is just a Christian interpretation, but Daniel Boyari, the Jewish scholar that I was citing in my opening presentation, agrees with me. He says that Mark chapter 14 is a link to divine status, and the figure in Daniel chapter 7 is a divine figure. Okay, I'll go ahead. Right. One of the interesting features of Old Testament is about the word Pascalio and the word Latre. There is not a proper pronunciation. But when it comes to both of those words, Pascalio is usually applied to Jesus, but the word Latre, which means direct worship, it's a high form of worship. That directly means worship. It's never applied to Jesus, it's always applied to someone other than Jesus, the Father. So the very first on the of the Testament shows Jesus than God. So he doesn't say I am God worshiping because the words of Jesus are not recorded in the Testament. Just to catch up on that, how uh, was that? 27. Yeah, so the rest of the to Mark, but those sayings in Mark were actually taken to talk that form of speech is called a prayer and it's based on the Islamic philosophy methods of arguing. So those sayings were actually invented. I'm sure you know what the system of rocks, that's what the category falls into. So we know it's invented. You need to look at the works of Diogenes of Sinop and Okay. Uh, next question, please. <laughs> um, for those, obviously. Um, I'm so glad you quoted that passage in Mark because I was trying to figure out in my head where the, the incident was, and you certainly talked to me on a silver platter. Um, so basically, the incident where Jesus is uh, on trial for Caiaphas. Um, where uh, they ask him, are you, are you the son of the living God? And he, you know, the whole reply that he gives, you say, and you will see the son of God, or the son of man coming down in power and glory, and all that stuff. So, here's the thing, when we, when we use the word you in English, uh, it can be pretty ambiguous. It can mean you, first per uh, second person singular, it can mean you, second person plural. It can also mean a general statement. So when I say, for example, you will see great wars and famines uh, in the future, it could be a general statement. It means humanity will see uh, great wars and famine in the future. But according to Daniel Wallace in his uh, advanced uh, Greek grammar, he says that in Greek, the word you cannot be used in a general sense. It can only be, when, when you say so, the word so in Greek, it can only mean second person plural or second person singular. So basically what Jesus was doing was he was addressing the high priest and the Sanhedrin at that time and he was telling them that you will see the Son of Man coming down in power and in glory. Okay, so uh, my, question question is, my question is, did that happen? And if it didn't happen, what do you make of the whole thing? Oh yes, I do. And this will give me a chance to discuss the other thing that he jazz. Uh, discuss regarding Matthew 24, 34. Um, just for full disclosure, I am of that camp that believes that those um, time verses are to be taken early when Jesus said, you know, this generation passed away, and then this generation. So I, I agree with you that Jesus is talking about the high priest. Yeah. He's talking to the high priest. So he's saying that the high priest will see these things. Okay? Um, that being said, when you understand the talk about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, you see right hand of the Father. Um, most, okay, so there is debate in, among Christians regarding eschatology, the doctrine of last things, and some people hold to a futurist view where these are things that we uh, shunted off to um, the far off future when Jesus comes back and um, the high priest will be resurrected, and then you will see uh, once he's resurrected the Son of Man coming. That's one interpretation. I don't hold to that, but that's one possible way of explaining it. The one uh, the explanation that I hold to is coming in the clouds of heaven is an expression of judgment. Um, the Lord coming in the clouds in the Old Testament is actually a way of saying the Lord is about to judge the nation in question. So when Jesus talks about that, I believe that he is referring to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. 
So that is within the general lifetimes of the peoples in question. So I believe this was fulfilled in the first century. Okay, so I will quickly respond to that. Uh, in cults, usually, when a prophecy fails, they find an ambiguous, uh, uh, not literal interpretation. So that's the case here, the prophecy failed, and so they have to find an alternative, and so they don't take it literally anymore. Jesus isn't coming, they don't appear again. So they change it to something being not literal. So they read the text, see that the prophecy doesn't come to pass, and then they change the interpretation of it. That's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I just uh, was wondering, in terms of the topic at hand, what your interpretation of Surah 5, 46 and 47 are, when they tell the um, al al the, the people of the Gospel, to judge by what they have therein, um, being the Gospel, and if they don't, then they're disobedient with nothing to stand on. So how am I, as a Christian, to take the Quran seriously? and judge by what I have there in the Gospel, if the Gospel's been lost and we don't have that anymore. Okay, so uh, just to answer briefly, this will be discussed tomorrow. So I will answer the question tomorrow, but just very briefly, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, what Syria Arabian manuscripts or documents did the Syria Arabian Christians have? And I have a wonderful book by Marcus Buckley, uh, the life and memory of Sarah Peter and Shukriti and memory. And he actually goes through some of the beliefs that these two Arabian Christians had. And they would not be considered orthodox. Whatever documents they had with them, they are considered apocryphal largely. So the problem there is, why are you equating the NGO with your New Testament, right? Christians have other documents, it just as they refer to your sect. That is a false equivalence, it's an equivocation. You need to first qualify as we will have to do tomorrow that when the Quran says in Jew, it refers to the Rakugo and the Testament, and that is a burden upon you. So I think that's the question. Okay, so likewise, I don't want to go into too much depth about what all this means because I don't want to give away any part of my presentation for tomorrow night, um, which is going to be fun, I have to say. But uh, you seem to be of the opinion that just because you have different sects um, of Christianity, that they must have different um, Bibles. Um, I can tell you right now that a lot of uh, denominational differences within Christianity don't have to do with variant texts or even variant translations. A lot of them have to do with variant interpretations of the same text. So you might have, for example, uh, two Protestants, both with the King James Bible. One is going to be a Calvinist, one's going to be an Armenian. They don't have any variations between their Bibles. They're using the exact same one, but they're interpreting it differently. So these Christians that you're referring to, yes, probably they may have been, uh, they may have been heterodox by the standards of the Byzantine Church. Uh, it's a thing of the historical evidence is still out on that. Um, but be that as it may. Uh, it does not follow that just because they have different theologies that they also have different texts. Thank you. So we'll finish with the two more questions. Okay. Um, yeah, again for uh, John. Is it? Yeah. Um, if, so you right? can, if you can't pronounce my name, just call me John. It's the easiest name to use John. I'm okay with that. I'm sure I'm home, Bobby. <laughs> All right, so my question is about the, the, the New Testament description of Jesus' death. There's uh, long significant uh, sections in the New Testament are devoted and, and uh, many times it's described, as well as his resurrection, but I specifically want to talk about his, his crucifixion, his death. Um, as far as I know, there are no historians who deny that Jesus died other than Islamic scholars. And that seems, the yeah, evidence seems to be so overwhelming that if, if I'm not mistaken, Shabir Ali believes that Jesus was crucified although he didn't die on the cross. So I'm wondering what your view is. Um, do you know of any scholars, historians, other than Islamic scholars, who deny Jesus' death? And uh, on what basis would you do that other than a prior commitment to Islam? Uh, apply what? A, a prior commitment to Islam. Okay. So two things. You mentioned Jesus' death, but scholars uh, deny it as well. First thing, number one, I don't know why you excluded Muslims from that, but Muslims are 1.7 billion people, and collectively we dispute that. Secondly, there is no historical tangible evidence of what is that. Uh, thirdly, even if he died, it does not mean that 
Jesus was a given. If I see brother Iman, God forbid, get hit by a car and he dies, I wouldn't think that he's God or that my sins were forgiven. Um, you, um, you asked me if I knew of any historians that denied it. I am not aware of any historians denying it, but there are many historians who deny that Jesus even existed. A vast majority of people believe that the, the flood of the when you appeared in a smaller place where Adam and Eve did not exist. So if you want to judge your faith based on what historians say, why haven't you rejected Adam and Eve? Why haven't you rejected some people? Reject other people of Israel or uh, in Egypt. So, uh, at the end of the day, if your basis for understanding your faith is judged by historians, then I think you uh, it's not consistent. Then you'll have to abandon certain terms of your faith. So, most historians agree that Jesus was a Jewish apocalyptic prophet, and on his earthly mission, he did not believe he was God. He didn't declare to be God. It's only a post resurrection phenomenon. So, if you want to go with the consensus of the scholars, then you must accept what this believe that Jesus was simply a Jewish apocalyptic prophet. So unless you are doing that, uh, you basically, you're not, you're not reaching a full conclusion. You're taking piece, bits and pieces from what historians say, and I can't accept that. For example, most historians don't even agree that what happened in the Testament is historical. They refer to it as a myth, and I don't know if you know this book by Gautam Mark. He actually mentions two things. How much time do I have? 27. I'll make it quick. Right? There's something called social formation and myth making. Social formation, like it looks come together and it's making. And he actually goes through and shows you why certain Christians believe things about Jesus, that how did it benefit their beliefs. And this is a book I'm referring to, you can see it here. Pick it up, it's a really good book, and it goes through to these chapters very in depth. Chris? You want your minute? Okay. Uh, I'll get to this really quickly. So we need to bear in mind there's a difference between facts and the Facts. So there are certain facts, and you know, regarding the historic, historical background of the Gospels, their writing, etc. And scholars will dispute how to interpret those facts, uh, and that a lot of that is based on the worldview that one comes from. And unfortunately, um, a lot of developments that have uh, come in recent years that have actually uh, painted the quest for the historical Jesus in a more positive light. Scholars these days are actually much more confident that they can discover what the original Jesus said and did than uh, in previous decades. Um, this is not taken into consideration by a lot of skeptics of Christianity. In fact, I have a quote by Lee Timothy Johnson, a uh, Roman Catholic New Testament scholar, in his writings of the New Testament. He says that an unfortunate aspect of this otherwise encouraging development in social research into social historical context of Gospels, is that many conclusions concerning the New Testament writings themselves on matters of dating, dependencies, perspectives, etc., have been left untouched, even though the methods of reaching those conclusions are now seen to be deficient, nor has this broader conception of the historical model moved much beyond the programmatic stage. So I would, uh, I would contend that um, this is a serious flaw in um, the liberal, uh, skeptical approach to the New Testament as a whole. Thank you. And uh, final question. <clears throat> Again, this is for Jewish. Uh, when it comes to the New Testament, the, those that we quote all the time are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is there any reason why Barnabas is excluded? There's a very simple reason. It's because it's a medieval forgery, because the earliest copy that we have of it dates to the 16th century. And um, somebody can correct me on this, but I believe that the earliest extant copy that we have of it is in Italian. And the people who've researched it have, noted, have uh, come to the conclusion that it's based on an earlier version of the same text that is written in Spanish. And it can't be earlier than the 12th or the 13th century. And you know why we know that? It's because the Gospel of Barnabas contains allusions to Dante's Inferno. That, that alone gives away the fact that it is a modern forgery, and no serious uh, academic considers it uh, to be in, um, in the running for an ancient document containing the life of Christ. It's not even in the same category as the other apocryphal Gospels. Um, I've, you know, some people will make much of, say, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas, and those have problems of their own.
but when the Gospel of Mark must take those problems and multiply them a thousandfold. There is no, uh, that document has no, no chance um, in hell of being uh, anything close to a historical document. Yeah, I guess I'll respond to that. I would have to agree with Lewis, but we also have to apply the same criteria to, to the New Testament writers. Very recently, I think last year, Lewis is aware of this, uh, the Gospel of the Wife of Jesus was discovered uh, by Professor Mary King. is a professor, doctor, I don't know. Mary Yeah, same difference, right? So, uh, basically, she came to the conclusion, along with other scholars, that the uh, Gospel of Jesus' wife dates very early, and that the text reflects a very early text. Now, some people dispute as much as this to the text that's in the New Testament, but this is how they were able to reject that as an authentic gospel. They didn't ask the Holy Spirit, they didn't get inspiration to reject it. They rejected it on the basis of the person that they got the document from. They believed the person was a forger. So based on the character of the person that the gospel originated with, they rejected it as being authentic. And also, we do mustalality, we do java to deal, we do character sciences and the the characters of people. And when a character is unknown, we can't identify with uh, the pattern of the text or the chain of the text. So in that applies to the testament, we we'll also have to reject the their writings. Thank you. So I would love for this Q&A to, to keep on going on, but I want everyone's full attention for the concluding remarks, which are just five minutes each. So, uh, correct? Yeah. So Lewis will give a five-minute closing statement, and then we'll conclude with Jazz's five-minute closing statement. I may reconnect. Uh, I'll just tell you what it is. It's the penultimate slide to my opening presentation. I listed some problems for Islam. Islam regards Jesus and his disciples to be Muslims. Yet, there is no evidence of any proto-Islam in the apostolic period. No matter how far you go into the early history of the church, the theology that you're going to find there is unacceptable to Muslims. It's better. And the Islamic world we ultimately cannot account for the development of Christianity. So I laid that out in my opening statement. I wait to hear if Ijaz will rebut this. He, he didn't touch it in his rebuttal. He didn't touch it in our cross-examination. And he also didn't touch it in our Q&A. So I believe the challenge stands that we have not found any evidence that the first century looked anything like what the Islamic world means it as. Now let me go to the two main arguments that I presented in the beginning. With regards to prophecy. Why am I putting up the Old Testament in a debate about the New Testament? Because the New Testament's reliability is intrinsically linked to the Old Testament. The New Testament says that it is fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament, and unless it does so, neither of those two books can be the Word of God. And I would suggest to you that only one person has ever fitted all of the categories of the Messiah in all of history, um, and that is Jesus Christ. If the odds of one person fulfilling all the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament are one in ten to the day of power. That's analogous to covering the state of Texas knee deep in pennies, marking up a single penny and asking someone to come down and anyone blindfolded. As for whether or not the eyewitness testimonies were fabricated, um, it has been said, and it is a good point, and I've never heard a good rebuttal to this, that nobody ever dies for something that they know to be a lie. The, and the apostles were in a position to know if the accounts that they're presenting are true or not. Um, Simon Greenleaf, who wrote a book examining the gospel evidences in light of um, standard procedure and law, he says, and I quote, such conduct of the apostles, I mean dying for their message, would moreover have been utterly irreconcilable with the fact that they possessed the ordinary constitution of our common nature. If then our testimony is not true, there is no possible motive for its fabrication. And this, all, all this shows the failure of the Islamic worldview. The Islamic worldview cannot account for the biblical concept of messiahship as, found, as it's found in both the Old and New Testaments, and how it can affirm that Jesus is the Messiah while rejecting all that that title Messiah entails. It also can't account for the rise of Christianity in the New Testament documents. And if you will, if my friend tries to go into all the details, uh, but he never explains to us how, from a Muslim perspective, all this can be accounted for, um, which leaves us with only one worldview that can truly account for all the facts, and that's a Christian worldview. So I leave you with the sayings of Jesus 
in John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And um, as a postscript, everything that you've heard from me is what in Christian theology is called a presuppositional approach. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it gives me a chance to give each as a present. This is a classic work in apologetics called uh, The Defense of the Faith by Cornelius Van Til, which uh, goes into um, the Christian worldview and how it explains reality uh, as opposed to other worldviews. And I would like to give that this to Ijaz. And also, the local talent, Joe Boot of Westminster Chapel and the Ezra Institute, a great man, has done a lot of important work in cultural apologetics. He has a book called Searching for Truth, subtitled Discovering the Meaning and Purpose of Life. So I am going to take these two books and put it in the bag and give them to my great friend Ijaz in the hopes in the hopes that we will be illuminated by the content they're in. Thank you. Sweden is primarily one, that God can enter the sun, 
and that you will not have a son. And when it comes to the Messiah, it fulfills the conditions of the Messiah. A Messiah is simply one anointed by God. And we believe Jesus was anointed, appointed, chosen, selected by God. So it con the idea of Jesus as the Messiah fully conforms with his heart belief. So he goes on to say, what is it here? He goes on to say, John 14, okay, that was it. So at the end of the day, what were we looking for? He mentioned prophecies of Jesus in the New Testament. What's that? Okay, so one minute. I'll make it quick. You didn't get that. <laughs> you got it, Nick. Guys, you didn't do that. So at the end of the day, what did Lewis bring forth as evidence for us? He says that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament, but when you want to make someone into Messiah, if you want them to fulfill the prophecies, you simply write it that they did. Just because someone wrote that they think Jesus fulfilled those prophecies, it does not mean that Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. Someone could have written that Moses or Ahmad fulfilled those prophecies. Jesus, um, Lewis isn't going to start following a cardiac release. He isn't. So at the end of the day, if he's going to appeal to prophecies, he first needs to qualify that there are more evidences that he's going to choose that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. And we actually have no evidence of that. So at the end of the day, what we asked for was proof that, he, that the New Testament was the word of God. What we got were about prophecies in the Old Testament, about all the Islamic concept of, of a Messiah isn't coherent. We didn't get any positive evidence for that New Testament in God's word, which at the end of the day means that the New Testament has no legs to stand on. He can provide textual critical evidences, he can provide anything special about the New Testament. If it's the word of God, then there must be some spiritual way of identifying it's the word of God. But he couldn't give us that because there is no spiritual matter. If the Holy Spirit is with Lewis or with any of the Christians, then it should be easy for them to know what variant is correct and what isn't. But the fact that they can't and they have to rely on secular, disbelieving people who reject the New Testament as the word of God to be so uh, perhaps we can give both of these speakers a round of applause. Uh, I hope that was a lot of intellectual food uh, for everybody. And uh, I mean, I know both Ijaz and uh, Lewis, and, and I'm friends with both of them. But still, I'm surprised and impressed at how much knowledge they have and just how much they research uh, these topics. So uh, I hope that we'll come back tomorrow because tomorrow will be part two of the debate and the topic for tomorrow's debate is uh, what does the Qur'an and the Islamic tradition say about the Bible? So that will be the debate for tomorrow night which will also be at 7 p.m. and it will follow the same format as uh, tonight's debate uh, and uh, that's basically it. We hope to see you all tomorrow. Have a safe journey home. Thank you for coming. Assalamu alaikum.